Sven Var gave a pretty cool interview with Mix Mag. Um, I'm not sure what this is tying into. Maybe he has a book or a record out at the moment, but maybe it's just an interview with an absolute legend. I'm not opposed to that myself. But there was a very interesting quote here that I found really cool that I wanted to speak about. Um, and it's the following quote. Was it also called? Da, da, da. Okay, this is a quote that I kind of, again, maybe it's something I only have to speak about for myself just to kind of gain a bit more of a just to kind of make humble me down a bit more and kind of like maybe drive me to a bit more a bit more hard work when it comes to selecting tracks for mixing and stuff but this is fairly interesting so um what he said here let me find a quote for you we just copied that one there yeah so this is the quote from sven var that i thought was really interesting so this interview from uh mix mag and it's titled 100% Vinyl, Why Sven Var Will Never Abandon Turntables. His decade-long love affair means uh, more work, more prep, and a hell of a lot more luggage. But Sven Var is not changing his tunes. Um, this is, of course, a really insightful article, of course, you know, detailing Sven Var's love for vinyl. The fact that even Sven Var even DJs at the boiler room using vinyl, which is absolutely insane. If you're familiar with any kind of boiler room venue, you'll know that most of the spaces that these guys use for boiler room aren't necessarily you know um clubbing aren't necessarily vinyl friendly there's not a lot of um air conditioning or a lot of ventilation passing through those places records can warp due to the you know due to the heat and the in general from conducted from the, the the equipment and people's body heat in there the lack of ventilation you know can maybe make your record skip and shit uh people beating and jumping around next to the table can obviously affect that as well so it's not the most conducive area space to kind of use vinyl but Sven Vaz always played vinyl when he's at Buena Room. Always. Always played vinyl. It's fucking insane. Like, it even, even does that at festivals. Sometimes they'll have, like, a little windshield. I think there's a picture here up here that shows it. Yeah, sometimes he has this little windshield that kind of helps to protect it from all the elements. But still, man, it's a hazardous, hazardous thing to do. And if you've been... If you're familiar with playing on vinyl, as I have in the past, or if you're uh, just learning how to DJ at the moment... Especially, do you remember when you start DJing and you're not sure how to beat match properly and you're afraid of missing in a track because you you're afraid of it clanging? That's essentially the feeling I get every time when I mix with vinyl. Because you just don't know, right? You just have no idea. You, you, you let the skills, you let the practice, you let the technique to kind of make it work. So I can only imagine how nerve-wracking that must be for me mixing at home or mixing in a pub surrounded by 10 people. How much more for Sven Var on the stage in front of 30,000 people DJing on vinyl, do you know what I mean? Like, he takes fucking balls of steel. But anyway, it says here at the, at the end that really um kind of touched me in terms of what he says about um ba, 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 about records, right? So here's something he says about records. So let's just read the beginning part of it. It says, um, um, another issue for vinyl-only selectors is that economy uh, economic situation for labels and artists means that so much music released today is digital only. Sven insists that anyone who wants to give him music provides their tracks on a dub plate as well as by, as pressing his own. I've told all young DJs and producers, don't give me a USB stick. If you want me to play your records, you have to at least give me a dub plate. That's impressive. That's also, also cool because what it does is that it immediately self-selects people who are really about this life because most producers who can't be bothered are the producers that probably Sven Var shouldn't be talking to in the first place. So if you go out of your way to make a dub plate for Sven Var, uh, right or to make an edit or to just get it ripped onto vinyl in the first place you know that you're really really are committed and you're probably are at the level where you think your stuff is ready for us because i wouldn't want to chuck my first couple of demos so in Vars direction right you'd want to obviously give him your best work and um again there's no guarantee he's going to play it but that is pretty cool that he does that actually really really cool especially somebody of his level it's just insane that he does that right this guy flies around on private jets and he's you know willing to accept dub plays from randoms that's pretty cool um Every week I'm on the road, he says, someone will give me a record with a note saying, please play my music. This happened to Emmanuel Stati, who releases who releases with us a lot now. Oh, amazing. He created a beautiful sleeve with professional artwork and everything. That's what it takes, right? Again, these are these are the, um, the unintangibles, the things that people don't talk about that kind of allow you to kind of progress up the ranks in any of your perspective fields. Um, it's something I've, I've been very cognitive of. I've been very aware of like every time, imagine if I get interviewed for a job somewhere and they ask me for a proof of work. I sometimes, I sometimes go out my way to send them. Oh my Jesus Christ. I sometimes go out my way to send, let's put some um, airplane mode. I sometimes go out my way to send the label or to send, sorry, to send the employer 
a complete social media plan, some con some kind of mock-ups of work that I think will work well for them. I really got my way to make sure that I try to demonstrate that I can do the job. And the idea behind it is that going above and beyond is going to differentiate you from the crowd of people that are also vying for the same position. And I think it's, it's even more so, and it's even more important in the DJ world where essentially everyone's a DJ. It's a job that most people can do if you've got some taste in music. So the bar of entry is pretty low. So you have to really differentiate yourself. You have to really make every possible effort to differentiate yourself from the group. Whether it's creating custom artwork for your mixes, whether it's put, um, putting some money behind your uh, uh, social media post, whether it's kind of clipping stuff and putting and spreading with media, whether it's trying to get press, whether it's um, appearing on other people's podcasts, whether it's throwing your own parties and putting your money up that way so you can showcase yourself. There's loads of avenues that you can do, but there's many things that you should do in order to separate yourself from the pack. Because if you're just going to turn up and play music, on the USB stick and hope that's going to get you where you need to get to, you've got another thing coming because there's other people out there doing much more than what you're doing in order to kind of get just the bare minimum. So you really, especially in a competitive market, like, you know, any kind of uh, hip metropolitan city like London, you know, you're really trying to fight with the best of them to make sure your voice gets heard in that regard. So that story from this Emmanuel Sati is definitely a really cool uh, story. You know, he went up to, up to the turn bar, made, cut him a exclusive dub plate, made an entire record sleeve out of it, um, linear notes, all that sort of malarkey, handed to Sven Vine, of course, and it obviously helps if the music's good. But usually, if someone's going to that effort, it's not going to be shit stuff. You know, you know, you can't polish a turd. But then the bit that really struck out to me, that really kind of drung home, is something I'm going to definitely um, um, use as a as a guiding principle. Stuff that I'm doing here at home was the following. I also have somebody who buys me records, Svenbar said. I give them a budget and they gather up the music for me, sending packages every two weeks. Then I sit in my rocking chair at home and I do my homework, listening to all of them from start to finish. I don't skip through. I need to hear the whole record. Now, if you know, if you're familiar with Svenbar or if you're not familiar with him, right, let's just take, let's just, let's just pause a minute to see how crazy that statement is, right? If I do Svenbar and I go on Resident Advisor, Let's look at Svenvar's touring schedule, right? And see how nuts this is. That like, this guy is sitting down in his home somewhere with his kids surrounding him, vying for his attention, and he's listening to records from the beginning to the start every two weeks. Like he's going through every record that gets sent to him and selecting the songs himself. It's insane. Look at his look at his tour schedule, right? Look at look at that tour. I've got, I've got it on screen now, and it's just insane. Look at that tour schedule already for the past, like he's essentially been DJing every week, essentially, it feels like, right? Let's look at November. Look at the dates. Look at the look at the places that he's at in November, right? It's all split up, of course. Like he does the first two weeks and the last two weeks, but or the first one, the first week and the last two. But look at look at the locations. Look at the locations: France, Switzerland, U.S., Miami, Chile, right? Then you go to October. Increases again. Um, Holland, uh, Germany, 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 Italy. September, and these are all dates, probably a couple of days in between each other, right? Um, he's DJing in Germany, Germany, IB for Spain, Greece, Dusseldorf, uh, United Kingdom and Spain. All this traveling and somehow this guy finds the ability to go through records and listen to them, um, you know, all the way through. What excuse do I have? I have no excuse. I really have no excuse. And I don't think anyone else listening to this who's also a DJ has any excuse either. You have to do the homework. And that, I think, again, is what separates the good DJs from the great DJs. I think there is this argument out there that if you want to get more gigs, you have to produce and you have to kind of, you know, have, um, you have to be that kind of a Swiss army knife of DJs, right? You, you can do various different genres. You're, you know, maybe an expert in one, but you can DJ probably to a good standing in other genres. Um, you have the ability to make a track. You can make edits. Those things are going to obviously add to your law. And of course, if you're able to make a producer track, and it blows and it becomes the next big thing, you could then kind of ride that wave in order to kind of get more bookings. But usually, those producer DJ guys kind of fizzle out. Usually, people realize quite quickly they're not really good DJs. They don't really have good musical taste. They're just able to make good songs, right? Which is different from having good taste. But having good taste and being a really good DJ, I think of someone like Gerd Jensen, and I think of the kind of stuff that he listens to. I think of the publications that he reads, the videos that he watches. Those will all influence the kind of songs that he's going to play in the music scene. I think that's where that's where that's the work that's needed to be done behind the scenes before you even get in front of the decks. Which is sometimes why I'm of the belief that sometimes this this um, focus on mixing and blending and how you do that, how you drop tracks is ridiculous. And sometimes even the social media stuff, putting your hands in the air and clapping is also dumb because I think part of the work that really separates you, why DJ Harvey is a legend that he is now, is that people were raving and hollering about the breadth of music genres that he played throughout his entire set. 
Now, granted, it's six hours, but he was able to take you on a complete musical journey. And that's what people were raving about. I never really heard people talking about his mixing or about, you know, whatever effects. People just were talking about his song selection. So imagine being that kind of DJ. And that only happens because you've done the homework at home. You started at home. You've gone through the records. and You've done everything that you can do to make sure that the records that you're playing are a reflection of yourself. And also elicit some kind of emotion, some kind of feel, some sort of texture, some sort of vibe. They're not, they're not necessarily just, you know, the top 100 tracks selected from Beatport. They're actually you going down and picking album cuts. And I've been always a fan of cutting or picking beat cuts anyway. I, I hate playing the title track of any EP. I like to select a couple of tracks that I think that are probably work, but especially if it's a track that everyone's banging and rinsing out. I'll purposely not play it and maybe play the B side, maybe play an edit just to kind of throw it off a little bit, give myself a little bit more of a challenge and also offer something different for the consumer. And again, if Sven Bar can do that, we can do that too. Um, but yeah, I recommend you check out the interview. It's really, really informative. It's a real cool love letter to basically turntablism. And, you know, there's no big avid, there's no bigger advocate of that than Sven Bar. So definitely check it out. Available now at Mixmag. The title is 100% Vinyl. Why Sven Bar will never abandon the turntables. Link will be attached in the show notes for you guys to check out.